Welcome to the Financial Freedom Podcast, where we interview remarkable people and share strategies for mastering money and living a meaningful life. With your host, Grant Sabatier, creator of Millennial Money and author of Financial Freedom, a proven path to all the money you will ever need. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. Very excited today to have Haroon Mok Tarzada, who is the founder and CEO of Truebill. Truebill is one of the largest fintech apps in the game designed to help you save money across your financial life. Haroon is a very successful entrepreneur. We actually really haven't had someone on the show before who has had this much success uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, specifically in the tech space. So I was really excited to bring him on the show to talk a little bit about his journey and growing and scaling businesses and taking on venture funding and all of that great stuff. So Haroon, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your background. When, when did you get into the entrepreneur space? Yeah, you know, look, I was one of those kids who were entrepreneurs, right? So I had like the lawn mowing business, the snow shoveling business, we had a magic show business as a kid. So I think it was kind of in me um, from, you know, from birth. And I think there's like a percentage of the population that are kind of like that. They're like sort of natural born entrepreneurs. They don't love the idea of working for someone else. They like the idea of their work aligning with the value that they create and, and the compensation being aligned with the value they create. Um, I started my first company at the tail end right when I was um, getting out of undergrad. I studied economics at the University of Maryland, and I started a website creation platform with my brothers. It was kind of like an early Wix or Squarespace, and it was called uh, webs.com. And uh, I ended up going to law school, and so we just were working on that on the side. It was like a bootstrapped kind of side project business, um, but sort of took a life of its own and, and grew big enough that we decided to kind of do that full time. So I graduated law school. I didn't, I didn't take the bar. Um, and then came back and that's when we raised venture funding and then sold the company uh, five years later. Um, that company sold for 120 million about um, to Vistaprint. And then I was at Vistaprint for several years and that's when um, sort of toward the tail end of that, I got back in the basement with my brothers and we started Truebill. So that's kind of the general arc of the story. And then Truebill was acquired by Rocket Company. For billions of dollars, correct? Yeah, it was about one and a half billion. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it, it worked out well. Let's go back to your, your first venture. Uh, did, did you build the tech? Did you, you know, do you have a tech background? I lucked out because my brothers were engineers. I, I wasn't a tech guy. Um, so I focus on the product, on the business side, on the design side, that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I had two brothers who are engineers. And so they built the tech. And so we did build it ourselves. Um, and then, you know, once we like, made a little bit of money, we hired like another engineer and went from there. So uh, when should someone take on venture funds? Yeah, I think this is a really important question. Um, and uh, I, I didn't know enough about it initially. The way I would say it now is it absolutely changes everything once you take funding. So you've got your own company, you're, you're in charge of your own time. You can take a day off, you can work, you can not work, you can grow as fast or as slow as you want right now, right? Um, and so that's really like an entrepreneur loves that level of freedom in general. The second you take funding, um, it's, it feels different. It feel, it does feel like not necessarily you have a boss cause they're not, it's not day to day, but you have a new level of accountability and there's a lot of self-imposed pressure. Even if you have a great board, that's like not bothering you a lot and stuff, there's just self-imposed pressure. Cause you're like, I don't want to lose people's money. There's reputational damage that happens. Right. Et cetera. And so like, I, everything changes. It's all fun and games until you raise money and then it really changes. You also can't walk away from the business. Mm -hmm. So like right now you could have something, some side project, you're working on it and you're like, you know what? I'm not passionate about this or I just want to do something else or whatever. And you can just set it down. You take, you take funding and it's like, no, 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 no. Like we gave you funding. Like you're here to do this. We have an expectation that that's why you did that. Right. And you feel like you've given your word to something. Um, I would say, honestly, you shouldn't take funding unless you believe it can be a public company. Right. Like the, hmm. it, from a venture fund, a venture fund fundamentally makes their money off of very large exits. And so they lose a bunch of money on a bunch of companies that don't go anywhere. And then you have a couple big wins that are unicorns or decacorns or whatever. And that's really what drives their returns. And that's where their focus is. That's what they're trying to build. That's who they you know, that's that's the type of CEO they're looking for is like, can this thing be really big? So you say, OK, well, what does it take to build a public company? It's like, well, it should be able to, you should see like a, a fairly easy path to like a hundred million in revenue that could one day be 500 to a billion dollars in revenue. And 
if you if you don't see that, I actually recommend people to do like friends and family and bootstrap and things like that. Um, because you really can get yourself into trouble otherwise. If you just if you if you raise funding, set an expectation, you're going for like a billion dollars, and what was right for the business was just to grow to ten or twenty million and just get really profitable. Yeah, like and you might make the same amount. Like you could if you if you take a company and you grow ten million revenue and half of that's profit and you're paying five million a year over ten years, you've made fifty million dollars. And that's, right. you know, after all the dilution and stuff, when you're, when you're taking funding and stuff like that, that might be very similar than a much larger exit in terms of how much you actually make. So how did you evaluate? Yeah. So look, there's some signaling value in getting a brand name fund into, into your company. So if you're trying to hire like really great executives, for example, like knowing that you're a benchmark or Sequoia or Excel backed company, it's helpful, right? Like it gives you kind of a stamp of approval, mm-hmm. just like having a degree from like an Ivy league school would do that. Um, Right. But but really what it should come down to is who is the person, who is the partner that's going to be on the deal, that's going to be then with you for the next five, 10 years. And that you should almost think of like, it's like another employee that you'd be hiring. It's like, is this the type of person I want to be working with? Like, are they going to be supportive in the hard times? Are they going to like help me in the times I need help? Are they going to back off in the times I need to back off? And then do they really believe in me and what we're up to? Like, do they believe in this thing or yeah. they want to take what I'm doing and they have their own vision and they're going to try to turn into something else that I'm not going to be interested in. So I, I think a lot really should be indexed on it's less the firm and more the person. Um, Cause you're really not going to yeah. interact much with the rest of the firm. There are some firms that will get a little bit more involved, especially early on. And so if that's something you really need, you could seek out firms like that, like something like unusual ventures, for example, hires a bunch of um, founders as part of their team. And so they like help with marketing or they help with like, early stage stuff that you that you need that you might not have all the tools for. But otherwise, I think it's like really up to like, who is the partner you want to work with? Um, And you know, are they going to be able to be helpful? So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, Truebill, you know, specifically, so you had a previous exit to to Vistaprint, I imagine, you know, you likely made a boatload of money, and probably didn't have to work again. Uh, I know, once you're an entrepreneur, you're always an entrepreneur. Can you talk about that mindset shift of having the exit and then coming back and, and starting something new? Was it just, you saw a market opportunity, you wanted to work with your brothers again? What was that kind of that, that, that spark that started, oh, hey, you know, I want to start a new company yeah. based around this idea? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and especially because venture back companies, you should think about them as like 10 year arcs almost. So it's a massive commitment to, to do a venture back company. Um, so we finished, yes, we did really well, was really happy with things. I, um, you know, I was at Vistaprint for a couple of years, then I sort of um, stepped back and was enjoying a really cozy life um, with a lot of free time. Um, and that was really yep. fun uh, for like six months. Um, but the other thing that right. happens when you sell a company is many entrepreneurs are very goal focused. And so it might have been for 20 years, you've been wanting financial independence. You're like, I can't wait to have financial freedom and stuff like that. And so reaching that goal can actually be quite disorienting because your whole identity is, has been a CEO running this venture back company growing. You've got all these employees who are counting on you and all of that. And so then that, when that evaporates, um, you sort of have to like redefine yourself and be like, who am I? What is my life about? Um, and you know, I felt like we, so my goal all along has been to get enough financial independence that I can really do sort of large impact projects for the world. Um, and so the amount we had made was like enough to be very, like, it, it was enough to be very comfortable for the rest of my life and be flexible and stuff like that, but not really like money that you could just like start throwing at problems and, and trying to really like go after stuff, um, or making mm-hmm. larger donations or stuff like that. So I did feel like I had, I had like one more act in me. Um, and also just felt yeah. like I wasn't really doing anything interesting enough with my time. And so and my brothers yeah. felt the same way. Like we were all just kind of like waffling around our days like what do we do with like what are we doing with our lives um and so right so we said like let's try something else and um the idea was it has to be meaningful like we have to like the mission that we're on and it has to be an opportunity we think is 10 times bigger than the last one um like those Mm. were the those were the like two things we were trying to that that i made myself like it has to do these two things for me to want to be full-time on it so who came up with the idea for for troops. It came from a problem. And I think it's really important that entrepreneurs do this um, is like, 
great companies come from like an entrepreneur discovering a really useful problem. Maybe it's their own problem or they see a problem in the market that they're in or something like that. In my case, it was a personal problem. Like I couldn't track my subscriptions. And I was like, this mm. was really frustrating. Like, how is there nowhere I can go? So like I went to Mint and other sites to do it. I was like, where do I see my subscriptions? And no one was doing it. I'm like, if you have my transaction data, like why wouldn't you be able to just tell me what I have recurring? Um, so yep. it started with that very narrow like problem use case. Of course, now it's like a full blown, you know, financial management platform. But it started with that narrow use case and said, like, I'm, you know, I have this problem. And then I, you know, and so I brought it up with my brothers. I was like, what about something that would do this? And they're like, that's interesting. And we we built a prototype. We all found stuff that we were paying for that we didn't want to pay for. Yeah. And so and then we started sharing with friends and family and they started finding stuff they didn't pay about. And we're like, oh, this is like, so we didn't know up front. We didn't know it's going to be a big deal. We didn't know any of that. We just started with a problem that we felt like needed to be solved. We had no idea how big it would be, um, how big of a problem it was, but we knew that we had the problem and like we were personally connected to the problem. I think once we did that and as the company started growing, we sort of took a step back and said, okay, what is this as a company? Right. And, and that's where the mission came out of it. It's like, okay, fundamentally we're helping people. We're going to help people meaningfully improve their financial lives. Um, and then second, like, okay, what's the extraction layer on like, what did we do with subscriptions? It's like, okay, they already had data, but it was really hard to see. So we're kind of like lifting the veil on people's finances, um, mm -hmm. and then making it easy for them to take action. So like canceling, like we cancel the subscription for you if you want, for example. Um, and so we said, okay, great. Where else can we remove that veil? Where else can we give this level of visibility? And that's why we went and built out like a full automated budgeting stuff, like full kind of like view of when your bills and subscriptions are going to hit so you can manage your cash flow, like your credit monitoring and just be like, okay, we're going to let you net worth tracking, like let you see it all in one place. And then you can make really good decisions and, and you know, be much more optimized with your money. What's that first step uh, that you take after you've got the prototype? I mean, are you and your brothers investing your own money? What what scale did you have to get to and what time period to take on external yeah. capital? Can you walk through a little of the growth? We growth ended path? up applying to an incubator called Y Combinator, which is kind of like the top incubator in the country. And we got in. And so they give you some initial funding. And then three months later, they have what's called a demo day where they bring a bunch of investors. You present what you're up to. And it's, it's kind of easy to raise money. You know, you raise a couple million dollars of seed funding. So we went that route. Um, it, uh, I think if we hadn't gotten into that, it's first of all, there's a question of would we have run with the company or not? Maybe we would have run it as a lifestyle business potentially. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, what I would say is, you know, there's, you can get seed funding pretty early, which is something like, I don't know, a hundred, couple hundred thousand or up to maybe like a million dollars to go and build something. But otherwise, you want to like have some signal from the market, like some someone's paying you and really likes it. <laughs> um, and that's like what signal really is like, you know, is like someone's paying for this product and they're sticking around with it after they pay. Maybe they're telling other people around it ab about it. And there's some addressable way to go and get more of those people. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the ingredients you want to have um, before you go and raise money. So you get the funding from Y Combinator, then do you go off and hire a bunch of people or, you know, how do you go from three people to that? Yeah. That so, so then we did, so we, we, we hired maybe like one or two people and then we had demo day and then we raised like one to 2 million and then we hired a few more people. So then the team was like, I don't know, like call it six or eight people. Um, and we were like that for a couple of years um, and then almost ran out of funding and really had to, we had to kind of, experiment with business models. And once we found a business model that worked, then we raised a series A, which was like 5 million. And we hired like a little bit more. And yeah. then we raised series B, which was 15. And then like we hired more. And like, it just was like that, right? Then we raised another $17 million round and then a $45 million round. And then, and then we exited the company when we were about, you know, getting closer to like, now we're closer to 200 people. So you seem like so even killed. We've never chatted before. You seem like a pretty mellow, chill guy. Is is this is this your everyday business sort of persona? Yeah. Or is this like post billion dollar acquisition, Haroon? Because I'm saying well, this to the extent of like I'm like whoa, taking you know forty four million dollars from people to grow my that I just like that just like I'm like my cortisol level is raised just <laughs> thinking about that. But like, are, yeah. are you just well suited for that? Like, I'm just saying it through the lens of like. How does someone determine whether they've got the disposition and the mindset? And I'm saying that because I have some not friends, but like people who are followers of mine who are getting big deals and you know, some companies that you would probably know who they are. And they're just stressed and they hate their lives. You know what I mean? And I'm kind of like 
yo, yeah. like, why are you doing this? Like the trade-off doesn't even seem worth it. Totally. I look, I, um, I, I, I do kind of like operate even keeled, but I do also, um, especially during some of these times in the company, it was really stressful. And yeah. being the CEO, you know, everyone's like, oh, the CEO is like, this is the job and they make this, all this money and stuff like that. It's like, it's not really a really fun job to be like a, a CEO that has a ton of people because like at the end of the day, the CEO can't complain to anyone, right? Like right. all of the complaints come to you, all the problems come to you. And mm -hmm. you, because you have full control or a lot of control, you can't just blame it on it. They can't blame it on someone else, right? It's just like, it's all on yeah. you. Um, and so it is, it is quite stressful and you have to like learn how to manage that. Um, but here's what I will say is like, it sounds super daunting. Oh, you raise like $50 million. That's crazy. But what it's gradual. You don't like day one, go and raise 50. So you raise a couple million right? and then you're growing and you add a few more people and you raise more and you grow. And you, and so like, as you're doing it, as you're going up, each step feels like a little more normal than than it did like a okay. year or two earlier than that and same thing like if you told me 200 employees how do you run the 200 employee company i'm like i have no idea like i didn't know how to do that it's just that like we've hired managers and they've built teams and then those people have hired people and like these teams have built up under them and it's 200 people um you know it just kind of like it happens in that in a it happens in a gradual enough way unless you're just like a rocket ship which is very rare um that like that like you can manage it yeah how do you hire those first like few people like delegate, you know, as you're, as you're scaling? I mean, is it just, are you finding people who are passionate about the mission? You poach in other people that you knew from you know, your previous venture, you know, how, how do you pick that, that kind of core group of people that, that helps you scale? Yeah. I mean, those early people are important and it's really sometimes hard to find a great early person who's also going to be great late person. Um, so you, mm -hmm. you need to think about like what you're hiring for. And it's like, I need someone who can actually come in and do work, not come in and like hire 20 people and, and not like, and manage because you only have two heads, let's say open or something like that. So you need people right. in those early stages that can really roll up their sleeves and get the work done and like do it really, really well themselves. And then once they basically have so much work that they cannot do it all of themselves, that's when they should be coming to you and saying, okay, now I need a second person because I'm going to give them this block of yeah. work so that I can do this other thing. Um, and it should really feel more yeah. like that. Um, I think you you look for like, okay, what are the actual skills that I really want them to have? And then it's a, it's a personality thing. Like you're going to be spending all day with these people. So it's like, is this the type of person yeah. I want to have, you know, like I want to have working with me. This is the person I want to eat with. Is this someone I'd want to hang out with? Like all of that. Any pieces of advice that you would give that person who's kind of earlier on in their journey, uh, comparing this path to, you know, kind of a solopreneur profit yeah. first type mentality. You can scale a lot more rapidly if you take funding, right? Like there's no way we went from a million dollars in, in annual revenue to a hundred million dollars in annual, re annual revenue in four years. Um, and there's no way you could do that without wow. venture funding because we did a lot of marketing to get ourselves there. And anyone knows Truebill, they've seen our ads mm -hmm. like everywhere, right? So it didn't grow yeah. by accident. Yeah. It grew because we had an equation where we knew we could spend this much and we could make this much. And we wanted to scale that equation. A really good yeah. time to raise venture funds if you know exactly that I can take this money and turn it into growth immediately, right? It's not like I'm right. going to take the money and then I'm going to like figure out what to do with it. I'm going to hire a couple of people. I'm going to do this or that. It's like, no, 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 no. I have like an equation. I have like a financial model where I can pour money in and more money comes back out. That's a really, really good time to be thinking about raising because you can just go faster and you know that like there's a sort of like a cash machine and that window of opportunity could close. And so, you know, then it's just a matter of like, get people around you that have seen it before and done it before. So when you have questions, those people can provide you with answers and help you through it. Um, but, but if it's not that, I just, you do have to be measured. Like a, a lifestyle business is also a really, really great thing. And right. you can make a lot right. of money with it and you can enjoy yourself and be on a boat whenever you want or whatever. Um, and so, just make sure you're up for it and you're make, you make sure you're up for like a, a pretty broad time horizon as well. So what does that, what does that equation kind of look like? I mean, you're looking at CAC, you know, there's cost per acquisition for customer, yeah. lifetime so, value of a customer, just, you know, we yeah. fire someone for $20 and make, 
Yeah, it's it, it's con- that every business basically is an LTV CAC equation, right? So it's like, what's the lifetime value and how much yeah. did it cost to get that person? That's pretty much every business. And you should, we actually like wrote out the formula with all of its components. Here's all the way we make money. Here's all the costs. Here's the marketing costs, et cetera. Um, and so uh, for us, we sort of keyed in on, okay, here's an LTV CAC ratio that we're okay with. For example, you say we want to make $2 for every dollar we put in. And then we would go to marketing and say, don't say, like, spend as, as little as possible to grow. We would say spend as much as possible within these parameters, within this efficiency parameter. And that's a very different mentality for a marketing team to have. It's not like, oh, your budget's this much. We say your budget's unlimited, but you have to be this efficient right. to spend. And that's how you can really, really scale quickly. Um, but, it, you know, it, it, you have to be really disciplined. You have to understand your metrics. You have to know... Like, is this, is that money actually going to come back in or not? Right. That you're predicting. Will yeah. Come back in. How much, how much of that was like performance marketing based? We you know, consider what, all of it performance. We actually track even our TV and stuff. We, we do our best to track it. Um, most mm-hmm. of it is not like a pay per install, but the vast majority is let's yep. say like Facebook or Instagram or TikTok ads or stuff like that, where it's maybe pay per impression or pay per click. But then we're kind of calculating what that turns into from an install perspective. And then same thing, even when we run TV, we try to look at, okay, how much incremental, you know, installs did we get from this spot? And then we're computing sort of like, okay, what is the cost per install then um, from this TV spot? And then run it like that. Yeah. And then so on the LTV side, I know we're getting like really granular for the listeners uh, on LTV side, like, you know, I guess, cause I'm like tangentially like was in sort of this business. It's like, were you adding in sort of the credit monitoring sort of like credit karma suite of products in order to increase the revenue and LTV. So then you could just go out and pay more and more per customer or was there, cause uh, I imagine during this time period, right. Facebook ads were getting yeah. more expensive. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, I so, think you're at a point now where everything's so expensive. So how did you ma- manage that? Yeah, so so uh, basically, if you can increase your LTV, that means you can pay more. Your CAC can go up, and you can keep the same ratio, right? So during right, the course of right. the years, the game is to increase LTV. Now, we made this decision that we're gonna we're gonna ask our customers to pay us for this app, and we're one of the mm-hmm. first or very few very few fi- financial apps do that. Um, they find other ways, like credit cards, mostly ads and affiliate links and stuff like that. The reason we did right. that is we we realized if we do that, we can just focus on building a really great product because we and we won't have mm-hmm. to like jam ads to our customers all the time and stuff. So um, right. once you have a subscription business, the way you increase LTV is by increase, increasing the length at which someone stays and continues to pay. Mm-hmm. Retention, yeah. Retention. So all of those things that we were doing were retention plays, right? To just enrich, like you're mm-hmm. paying... Let's say you're paying $5 a month for a subscription thing. Now you have a credit report monitoring for free in addition. And so it's more valuable. And then now you have like a budgeting tool for free that's in addition to that. And so Truebill just kept get, getting more and more valuable for the customer base as time went on without them having to pay anymore. But it extended the lifetime value. And so that helped us on the LTV CAC equation. Uh, so you're monitoring like retention like what? What is that? It's like some. It's like some ratio where it's like, are you getting enough new subscribers to more than make up for the ones that you're losing? Right? It's yeah, like, well, or, like or the other like, way, like, like a SaaS company. Yeah, or it's like, what is the average months a user sticks around? So if it's ten months and you're paying, you're getting five dollars a month. That's fifty dollars per user. If you extend that mm-hmm. ten to twenty months, now you're now each user's worth a hundred dollars, right? So that's yeah, the way we looked yeah, at it. Yeah. We'd say like, what does the retention curve look like, and what is the expected value of like a user over, let's say, like a three year period? Uh, and then how how does that work from like it, does it happen at the C the the CEO level like for business cash flow planning like so you figure out this equation and I guess so then you going out and getting forty million dollars and because you know that every twenty dollars you spend you're going to make you know fifty dollars and then you just pour it into that or how how do you as the CEO yeah I worked with our head of finance to actually build a model and then the bo- the model mm-hmm. showed okay if if our CAC is this much per user and we spend this much per month right over time and so we slowly like increased in this model like we spent 100k per month then we spent 120 then we spent 150 per month and like we we're going to slowly figure out how to spend more and more per month at this efficiency level and then it just spits out like what happens to the business this is where the revenue is going to get this yeah. is where the profit's going to get etc right and then you add in okay we're going to need this much employees to get there so that's the cost and so it, it all came down to a financial mm-hmm. model that we would track every month and make sure like hey are, are the assumptions holding in this model 
And, you know, we refine that model. And then, yeah, we could go to people, investors and say, okay, look, this is the model. This is the way the business works. Mm. Um, and we just need the money, you know, to spend to, to get it to this point. Is there like a, a scale to this where you're like, oh gosh, like we can only get X number of users or does that ever become a concern? Um, so, uh, that was probably the most, the most major objections from investors that said no. And many, many investors said no to us was this question of TAM, right? Total addressable market. And there's kind of like mm, budgeting is mm. a niche market. It's maybe like five or 10% of the population really want to do that. And so you're going to just bump up. You're not going to be able to spend millions of dollars a month on marketing. You're going to be able to spend 100 or 200 K. And so then the thing is just going to grow too slowly. Um, and so right. you do have to have an idea of like how, you know, what is either the product that people can pay you a lot for it and you can get big like that. So like 10, you know, like SaaS businesses, right. they pay $10,000 a year and, and you just have like, you know, a hundred businesses, you're making a lot of money. Or this is like right. a very widely accessible product. It's going to appeal to a very, very broad audience of people like Netflix, where it's like, okay, a hundred million subscribers or whatever they have. Um, and those are the two ways you can mm -hmm. scale like a subscription business. Were you able to figure out what the TAM could be or? or... Um, we sort of looked at, look, we, we sort of were like, actually every US household basically needs this. So we just focused on like, right. the and, and then we said like, probably if they're below if they're like above 45 or 50, we're going to have a harder time getting to those people. So we sort of looked at the audience of like adults from like 20 to let's call it like 45 or something like that. As a CEO, are you like looking at like a Tableau dashboard or a Domo dashboard or some BI dashboard where you're tracking this stuff? Um, or, you know, do people hand you reports? Like how, how did that work actually technically for you? Yeah, we used um, two things. Um, we used like Looker um, as, as one dashboard that had like, okay, this is how many like, there's like a daily dashboard. It's like, this is how many new users, this is how many new premium customers. This was like our day one churn rate, like things like that, like just kind of like um, health metrics. And then we used Amplitude. Amplitude is a really great way to track kind of like all of the funnels in your app and what's going on with them. And so it's like, we have a chart that's like, this is the sign up funnel. And you can see like, did something drop or did something go up in it? Um, and this is the like, so what percentage of people sign up and like get through the whole funnel or like, this is, you know, this, this is like how many people are hitting errors. This is how many people are like activating this feature. And so between those two, um, we'd look at them and then our teams would also watch them as well. And like then alert up if there's any like, you know, any issues or causes for concern. And uh, now I want to move just just before we end to the acquisition, the the billion dollar plus acquisition from Rocket of Truebill. Can you talk about that, that, that the, the valuation models, did you work, have to work with a broker? Like, what did that look like? And at what point did you get to, was it just companies approaching you? Did you actively go out and seek uh, potential yeah. buyers? Can you talk about, you know, once, once you really settled in, what did that look like? Yeah. So actually, you know, Rocket approached us initially and kind of gave us a vision for why they thought it'd be interesting. We thought that was interesting. So I went to the board and said, I think this is interesting. And they said, okay, well, uh, let's do a market check. And so we hired FT partners, which is like, you know, um, bankers mm -hmm. in the FinTech yep. space. And they introduced us to a bunch of different companies. Um, and there was a good amount of interest um, from several different companies. Um, in terms of the valuations, we basically just looked at like, we had done, we'd just done that $45 million round. Um, so we were like, you know, uh, sort of at the beginning of that year, we were like worth 600, uh, 600 million. And we, uh, we had grown a lot. Like, so we had sort of doubled or more by the end. So that sort of set, set some of the price for us. Um, one thing that's nice about a venture round is it generally puts a floor on like your acquisition price, right? Which is nice. Um, cause uh, everyone understands yeah. that like, okay, these investors want to make money. So it helps price the, the company. Then we looked at other companies where like, mm -hmm. look, these are companies that SPAC, these are companies, whatever they're trading at, you know, 10, 15 times revenue or things like that. Um, and so that's how we got, kind of got to that price, but also the market decides the price. So it's like, what are people, what are the numbers that people were circulating to us? We also had venture deals mm -hmm. on the table as well. So it was like a combination of there's M&A and there's venture. Um, and we sort of communicated that, look, this is the price range that stuff is coming in. Um, and so you, it's really important to get more than one deal on the table to kind of create, create a situation like that. Um, and then we ended up picking the partner that we liked the most, which was Rocket, you know, deciding to join that company. And, and where are you now? Are you, uh, you're obviously still CEO of Truebill, correct? Yeah, so we're, we are, are wholly owned subsidiary. 
I'm the CEO and I'm also working on a lot of the strategy of like, how do we bring these things together? Like we believe that there's an opportunity to, with the mortgage company, build kind of like an entire financial life suite, right? So that the place where you manage your money, you can also have your mortgage, you can have your savings account, you can be tracking your net worth, you can tracking your home and really like just have like one dashboard for your financial life. So, I mean, do you have a particular period that like as part of the sale that you got to stick around or, you know, an earn out or, you know, what? what yeah, so uh, I mean, they've given us, you know, they've given us um, RSUs that um, vest over four years, um, which is yep. a fairly standard thing. Um, I, you know, what I believe in as a founder, as a good CEO is that you have, a, if someone buys your company, you have a responsibility to stay and deliver the value that they've purchased you for. And so, you know, I plan on sticking around for a while until I feel like we've really delivered that value. Man, Haroon Moktazada, CEO of Truebill, entrepreneur extraordinaire. Dude, this was so valuable. Thanks for sharing this with our audience and giving us a window into what it looks like to, to scale and sell for over a billion dollars. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks for having me.